Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Navigate the Technology Landscape in Predictive Genomics, an Introduction to Key Technology Concepts and Strategies. I am Matt Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermal Fisher Scientific. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also want to submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Anu Mittal, Senior Staff Scientist, Bioinformatics at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Anu, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this overview of genome-wide sequencing and genotyping strategies for predictive genomics research. We are entering the field of predictive genomics in a big way. So predictive genomics involves using an individual's genetic profile to predict the disease risk and understand drug response in order to improve the future of the future of health outcomes and managed costs. In this webinar, we'll introduce three key technologies, whole genome sequencing, low pass sequencing, and genome-wide axial microarrays. All the three technologies are used in predictive genomics research and offer very complementary capabilities. We will explore how these technologies can be integrated together across various applications of predictive genomics research. So we'll start with a quick overview of whole genome sequencing, low pass sequencing, and microarrays. Then I'll go through key considerations for the predictive genomics applications and discuss how each technology can be used to meet one's scientific needs. At the end of this deck, there are also some useful links that provide supplemental information. We also have some technical uh, terms and definitions in the end. So we'll start with an overview of the three technologies. Let's first review the next-gen sequencing first. Um, so both whole genome sequencing and low-pass sequencing are based on shotgun sequencing. The entire genome is broken up into small fragments of DNA, as shown in the left panel. These fragments are then sequenced and then assembled together using a reference genome. As shown in the right panel, there may be multiple reads that align to the same region of the reference sequence, while other regions may not have any reads at all. There are four factors to consider when planning a next-gen sequencing experiment. The cost per sample, the sequencing reads per sample, the accuracy of calls based on the research goal, and then the sample throughput. The whole genome sequencing is typically done at a very high coverage of over 20x, between 20 to 30x, meaning that every loci in a genome get the, uh, on an average, has 20 reads. And with 20 reads, you can reliably make a call. The level of coverage can be adjusted by multiplexing samples. So if more samples are multiplexed together, then each sample will receive fewer sequence reads. And this will in turn impact the genotyping accuracy. As you can see from the uh, illustration on the left, the low coverage sequencing reads are shown in pink. So the regions have fewer overlapping reads, and there are also gaps in sequence where there are no reads present. So multiplexing does reduce the cost per sample and increases the sample throughput, but it does that at the expense of genotyping accuracy. The fewer reads will impact the confidence of making the genotyping calls and can result in false positive or false negative calls. The low pass sequencing is uh, performed at coverage between 0.1x and 4x. And predictive genomics applications are typically carried out between 0.5x and 1x. So the experiment starts with multiplexing hundreds of samples together on a single flow cell, followed by sequencing at 0.5x to 1x. Then the reads are aligned to the reference genome, 
and variant calling is performed to get the genotype likelihoods. Then the imputation is carried out to refine the genotype calls and impute the missing genotypes. So in the end, all, all you get are imputed genotypes and no direct genotypes. So imputation has reasonable power for common and low frequency variants, but not for rare variants. So uh, rare variants are challenging to impute. And most, more often, uh, the rare variants are missing from the reference panels, and they will not be genotyped at all. So different applications may require different depths of coverage. In this uh, graphic, I'm showing on one end uh, LPS, where you multiplex a lot of samples to achieve coverage between 0.1x and 4x. This results in a low cost per sample, but at the price of genotyping quality. On the other end of the spectrum, you have deep whole genome sequencing at 20x coverage. You get very high confidence genotyping calls, but at the cost, but the cost per sample is high. I will discuss axiom microarrays in the next slide, but as shown in the table below, um, the cost of axiom microarrays falls somewhere between 0.5x to 1x. <clears throat> so the third technology in our introduction is microarrays. Uh, this is not a sequencing technology. Instead, it uses hybridization. So the glass surface of microarray is divided into square features, each of which contains many copies of specific DNA probe sequence. Uh, as shown in the first graphic, the different features have different probes represented in blue and green probes in the adjacent features. As shown in the second graphic, the probe sequences are carefully designed to hybridize a specific target sequence containing the genetic variant that exists in the population. Probes are designed for each allele of a variant, and microarray is able to capture either or both alleles if they are present in a sample. So once a, samples, a sample has been hybridized, DNA is fluorescently labeled and then scanned by the laser, and the fluorescent signal confirms which allele is present at which target locus. This slide highlights uh, the Axiom uh, microarray design capabilities. What differentiates Axiom microarrays is the content customization to meet diverse research needs. So with the help of proprietary array design and data analysis algorithms, Axiom arrays can address even the most difficult and rare markers. We have imputation design pipeline that can optimally select markers from next-gen sequencing data to provide high accuracy and coverage for the population of interest. We also have a proprietary database of 11 million markers that have been wet lab tested, and this ensures very high quality with small space. We also offer a modular design where customers can start from our catalog pre-made arrays or customize the appropriate content uh, representing their target population. So in terms of genotyping accuracy, uh, Axiom microarrays have shown to deliver high genome-wide accuracy as well as very uh, accurate genotypes of specific variants, and that in a very cost-effective manner. So the GWAS backbone on population arrays comprises of very highly informative markers, which are selected by taking into account LD patterns in a population to achieve very high imputation coverage in the population of interest. Um, in addition to the high genome-wide accuracy, axiom arrays also show high accuracy of calling specific variants. So using specialized algorithms and probe design capabilities, we can accurately genotype uh, complex yet important variants. Um, we've shown that uh, axiom arrays deliver very high positive predictive value for rare variants with a leaf frequency less than 1%. Then we can also address complex genomic regions such as pharmacogenes that suffer from high homology, frequent copy number changes, 
and low sequence complexity. Um, finally, um, axiomary is also show high accuracy of, for genotyping indels as well as copy number variations, which are usually difficult to genotype using next gen uh, sequencing applications. Now that we have looked at each of the technologies, let's compare them side by side. Whole genome sequencing prioritizes data quality at the expense of high cost per sample and low sample throughput. It's a very powerful uh, tool for de novo variant discovery across the entire map range. And the genotypes can be called directly from the sequence data for common, low frequency, as well as rare variants. However, the data analysis for whole genome sequencing is quite complex. Low pass sequencing, on the other hand, <clears throat> prioritizes uh, lower cost per sample and high sample throughput at the, ex at the expense of sequence data quality. So it relies on imputation for genotype calling. And as a result, uh, it has reasonable power for common and low frequency variants, but not for the rare variants. Um, low coverage uh, also makes calling of variants in regions such as high homology and frequent copy number changes um, and uh, uh, sequences with uh, low sequence complexity very difficult. So low pass sequencing can only genotype the variants that are present in the imputation reference panel. Um, and in addition of that, uh, with low pass sequencing, you also need to do uh, data QC and alignment, um, as well as imputation, which requires very high level of bioinformatics expertise. Compared to next-gen sequencing, uh, microarrays have very complementary set of capabilities. So probe hybridization is very specific, and it enables high-quality direct genotypes for rare as well as common and low-frequency variants. And the throughput can be scaled from less than 100 samples to hundreds and thousands of samples. Um, then um, just like low pass sequencing, microarrays can be used for uh, genome wide <clears throat> imputation of millions of common and low frequency variants. But uh, unlike uh, low pass sequencing, the data analysis uh, is much lower complexity. Um, one disadvantage of microarrays is that it cannot be used for de novo variant discovery. Uh, and the selection of variants for array design needs to be done carefully to minimize any ascertainment bias. So uh, we just discussed uh, whole genome sequencing, low pass sequencing, and microarrays uh, offer very complementary capabilities. Now, uh, next, let's see how these can be integrated together in predictive genomics research. So uh, predictive genomics aims to predict uh, disease risk and understand the drug response in order to improve the uh, future of health outcomes. And there are three main applications of predictive genomics. Population scale genotyping, for disease risk prediction through the polygenic risk scores. Then pharmacogenomics, which involves tailoring medication and dosage based on individual's genetic profile. And finally, uh, the third is carrier screening to understand the risk factors for a broad range of inherited uh, Mendelian disorders. <clears throat> Predictive genomics uh, is going to be the future of healthcare, and in order to make it mainstream, it's very important to accurately and affordably genotype variants that are associated with complex traits and diseases. So in the next part of this presentation, <clears throat> we will look at each application and challenges associated with them and explore the technology strategies for each of them. First, uh, let's look at the population scale genotyping for disease risk prediction through polygenic risk scores. So polygenic risk scores combine the contribution of multiple genetic loci, most commonly uh, common variants with small effects. And the goal is to estimate the individual's likelihood for a disease or a trait. 
The recent studies have also highlighted the importance of rare variants in predicting the risk for common complex diseases. So in order to support uh, polygenic risk score studies, the technology should be able to support large scale population wide screening at a low cost. Um, unfortunately, low pass sequencing, uh, uh, the whole genome sequencing cannot support it, whereas both low pass sequencing and microarrays can support this. Then it should be also uh, be able to support high genome wide accuracy across diverse populations, which all three technologies can deliver. One challenge, as I mentioned, is rare variants. Um, as the imputation of rare variants has a limited accuracy, uh, low pass has limited accuracy for, for uh, polygenic risk scores calculations that involve rare variants. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, the rare variants can be accurately genotyped by directly typing them on, on the axiom arrays. Next, let, uh, let's look at pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics involves uh, tailoring the medication and dosage based on individual's genetic profile. And for pharmacogenomics to be used in uh, personalized medicine, very high genome genotyping accuracy is needed. <clears throat> the important pharmacogenomics genes such as HLA, cyp 2 d 6 these have regions with very high uh, polymorphisms. They also have complex structures uh, and high sequence homology and are very difficult to genotype. As I've shown uh, in the example below, the cyp 2 d 6 gene uh, it's involved in the metabolism of over 25% drugs that are on the market today. Uh, if you have a pathogenic variant in this gene, then it can impact the efficacy of some of the drugs. CYP2D6 is a very complex gene and very challenging to genotype. <clears throat> it has high sequence similarity with the CYP2D7 silver gene and undergoes copy number variations and gene arrangements with CYP2D7. So any short read next-gen sequencing cannot deal with such complex genomic regions. It requires very high coverage, more than 20x for accurate genotyping. So low-pass sequencing uh, cannot uh, accurately genotype these regions. On the other hand, uh, axial micro microarrays can accurately genotype these regions by using complex probe designs, uh, some targeted amplification and also using advanced algorithms. So the final application we want to discuss is carrier screening. Um, severe uh, Mendelian conditions are largely caused by rare variants, which are very difficult to impute, as I've mentioned before. And uh, additionally, the rare variants are likely to be missing from the reference panels. So the NGS error rates uh, typically vary from 0.1% to 1%. So low pass has limited sensi sensitivity and positive predictive value for detecting the rare variants with frequency less than 1%. <laughs> In contrast, uh, rare variants can be directly genotyped on microarrays and can be uh, genotyped with high accuracy. Finally, uh, our choice for the best technology depends on multiple factors, especially the minor allele frequency we want to genotype, then the, uh, uh, the accuracy of specific variants we want to achieve, and the bioinformatics resources we have available. So if we consider the operational factors, we see that low pass is affordable, uh, but more costly per sample than microarrays, and it's also less scalable. So with low pass, a large number of samples must be multiplexed together to achieve the low cost, whereas microarrays can be used to run less than 100 to 100 thousands of samples. Then all next-gen sequencing methods have a high data analysis burden, uh, while microarrays by comparison is much simpler with well-established data analysis tools. Then if we move down to the table uh, to the genotyping needs, all three technologies can deliver high imputation accuracy. 
uh, low pass sequencing cannot be used to genotype rare variants because it relies on imputation. But uh, these can be directly genotyped on microarrays. And uh, um, then uh, the insertion uh, deletion variants are also often poorly imputed or are excluded from the imputation reference panels because of the difficulty in calling from next-gen sequencing, but they can be directly genotyped on the arrays. Um, then uh, low pass has low sensitivity for detecting small copy number changes, which are less than 1 KB, but these can be readily detected by arrays. So that's the end of the webinar. Uh, here's a link for some resources that are available from Thumb Official. There's a white paper available. Then there are also a few case studies that scientists interviews on Thumb Official Predictive Genomics landing page. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anu, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of these questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question here is, are there any precision medicine initiatives where microarrays have been used? Good question. Yeah, there have been several uh, large scale precision medicine efforts that have used uh, axiom arrays. And uh, just to mention a few, um, the, uh, there's a Taiwan Precision Medicine Array where the goal is to genotype 1 million Taiwanese individuals. Then there's Finjin Study uh, who are using Axiom Platform and there the goal is to genotype 10% of their population. There's also MedGenome Project in India. So all these studies are geared towards uh, managing health and prevention of diseases in their population. Then I'd also like to mention um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC. Uh, they're using our pharmacogenomics platform and they're looking to offer preemptive pharmacogenomics testing to over uh, 4 billion uh, patients that are enrolled into UPMC healthcare system. Okay, it's a new, uh, let's move on to question two. Can LPS be combined with targeted panels to address some of the challenges related to pharmacogenomics and rare variants? Yes, definitely. So um, the, uh, there are targeted uh, next-gen sequencing panels which, uh, which offer a small number of genes or specific variants. These can be combined with low-pass sequencing. Um, so the targeted panels are usually run at very high coverage um, and uh, they can be used to address uh, pharmacogenomics and rare variants that I mentioned are challenging with uh, low coverage sequencing. Um, but the drawback is that if you combine a uh, low pass with uh, the targeted sequencing, then they no longer is, uh, remain cost effective for large population initiatives. Um, in addition to that, the workflow also becomes cumbersome uh, that, and that includes both the lab workflow as well as the bioinformatics analysis, combining the data from um, targeted panels with the low pass sequencing. Uh, so um, uh, I, I'd like to mention that microarrays provide a single solution. You can genotype these targeted uh, regions as well as uh, get very high genome wide accuracy uh, at the same time. Thanks, Anil. Uh, looking, looks like we have one more question here. Pull it up. Uh, how are the population arrays designed and what imputation coverage can be achieved using Axiom arrays? Right, so again, a good question. Um, so the population arrays have a G GWAS backbone, uh, which is selected using our proprietary imputation aware marker selection algorithm. Uh, and the markers are selected <clears throat> so that they efficiently cover both common and low frequency variation in multiple populations. 
huh? and to ensure high performance as well as optimize uh, the use of space on the arrays, the, the markers are selected or the probe sets are selected from a pool of our 10 million high performing experimentally verified probe sets. Um, so we can leverage uh, the thousand genomes reference panel uh, or any other custom reference panel for the design. And we take into account the LD architecture in all populations simultaneously uh, to achieve equivalent imputation power in each population. So to give some sense on the imputation coverage um, that, that we can achieve, so with 1,000 genomes reference panel uh, with roughly 800,000 markers, we expect to achieve a, a imputation accuracy of over 93 to 95% for common markers. And for the low frequency markers with a MAF range between 1 to 5%, we can achieve a coverage with an accuracy between 80 to 90% in all five continental populations in the 1,000 genomes. All righty, thank you again, Anil. Great presentation and thanks for your time. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. But before we go, we'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can also be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We do encourage you to share that email with all of your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.